A man wants to place an order by telephone for some office stationery. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man, and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press one. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is six nine two four double one. Six nine two four one one. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers? Uh, no, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, okay. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John? Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4. That is normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or Manila. Um, we'll have the plain white, please.、Uh, but the ones with the little windows. Okay. One box A4 white. Just the one box, was it? Um. On second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are five hundred sheets to the pack. Right, let's see.、Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So, can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. The woman asks the man if he needs anything else. Look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to their conversation, and answer questions eight to ten. Anything else that we can help you with? Um,、uh, let me think. What else do we need? Ah,、uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Yeah, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right, floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. Okay, can you include a wall calendar then,、uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And、um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. 
Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because I have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear some announcements made to a group of people who are planning a trip to Greece. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. I'm getting very excited about this trip to Greece, and I'm sure you are too. As you know, we didn't have all the details at our last meeting, but I can give them to you now. We'll leave London Gatwick Airport on British Airways next Wednesday. Please be sure to be at the airport by 630 I know it's early, but our departure time is 8.25 a.m. We're quite a large group and we don't want to have any hassles. Please be sure to have all your travel documents ready. We'll arrive in Athens at 2.25 in the afternoon and there'll be a vehicle there to meet us. It'll be a full-sized coach so everyone can travel together. We'll spend three full days in our hotel in Athens although we're only being charged for two nights' accommodation, which is good news. The second day, we'll go to the National Archaeological Museum to see the enormous collection of ancient Greek works of art, antiques, statues, a brilliant display. We'll eat out at a typical Greek restaurant on Thursday night. It's going to be a very busy time in Athens. Friday morning and afternoon, we'll visit historic sites but we have nothing planned for the rest of the day. On Saturday, we're off to the islands, the Greek islands of ancient myth and modern romance. Now the big news. At first, we thought we'd take the ferry, but we've been very lucky to secure a sailing boat, which is big enough for all of us. I'm really excited about this part of the trip because we'll see the islands to the best advantage and we'll be able to cruise around and sleep on board. We'll get off at different islands and for one part of the trip we'll have people playing Greek traditional music actually on board with us. Now I'll pass out a brochure with all the details. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. A lot of work has gone into organising this tour and I'd like to thank in particular the travel agent who got us a really good deal and the people at the British Museum who offered us such good advice. Trips like this only happen because of the hard work of really expert people. As you know, we have planned a gathering for when we return. I have a list of things which the committee would like you to bring to the party. They are 
your pictures and something to eat for everyone to share. You are almost bound to have people ask what we have in common and why we're travelling as a group. I suppose the answer is that we're interested in learning about old societies and vanished cultures and we all enjoy travelling. Of course we enjoy fine food too, but that's not as important. Oh, I nearly forgot the last piece of information. You'll see there are labels which I have passed around for you to put on all your luggage. Could you fill them in, please? On the top line, please write Greek tour. And on the lower line, write in block letters, I mean uppercase, the letters AA and the number 3. That's double A3. We need to have these labels clearly displayed to help the baggage handlers keep our luggage together on the different parts of our trip. So please don't take them off. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a lecture about studying history. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to begin this term's lectures with a discussion of the various sub-disciplines in history. Before I do that, though, can I refer you to the handout you picked up on the way in? It deals with two general topics. The first is, why study history? And the second is, what is history? Neither of these questions has an easy answer. In fact, People have been asking these questions for as long as history has been studied. However, as you are mostly new students to this subject, and we have some students of economics with us also, I feel you should have some background to these basic questions. Anyway, it's all in the handout. I might add that for me personally, the most important reason for studying history is that I find it exciting. Our ancestors can remain, if we want them to, a mystery a closed book, a blackness that we never see into, or we can come to know what motivated them and discover how that led to the world we live in today. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. You who have chosen to pursue the study of history are very fortunate. This is a time when we can talk not just about history, but histories. Traditionally, history was seen as one subject, and the subject matter was clear. It was about kings and queens and wars. Additionally, it was about states and empires, or groups of states. This is what we now call political history. The subtopics were the parts of the world, for example, the history of China or of France. 
History has moved on somewhat, and we can learn a lot about current views of history by looking at the proposed lecture topics in our leading universities. In fact, you'll see that even the simplest definition of history, that it is about what happened in the past, is up for grabs. Some of the more, how shall I put it, progressive areas of study are as much about what should happen in the future. One example of this is the field of postmodern history. Likewise, feminist history looks at the past to make sure the future will be different, and it uses the past to assist in its efforts to make the future as it wants it to be. Somewhere in the middle of these two extremes lie a range of areas of study which have developed over the modern period, replacing the traditional idea of political history. These are by now mostly well established. You can study social history or economic history. Social history asks about the ordinary people and their lives, not just their daily lives, but their contribution to changes in our society. Ordinary people have desires and wishes which they try to put into effect, and this has a massive effect on social development which was not fully understood in the traditional study of history. By the way, one area of traditional history which I forgot to mention, but which has had a resurgence of interest in recent years, is the area of military history. This was, of course, of great practical use in more violent times, and unfortunately has become of increasing use and interest, academically and practically, in our own times. By the way, there is a new series of lectures on military history in our department as if to demonstrate the truth of what I've just said. Ethnic and multicultural history are further examples of kinds of history which, like social history, differ from the traditional forms. Ethnic history is a modern concern which concentrates on the value systems and beliefs of a people, usually a minority people, which were ignored in the rapid forward march of the rich and powerful nations and states. How various ethnic groups live together and how their traditions change and develop is the subject of its contemporary cousin, multicultural history. In sum, as I said, you are fortunate to have such a wide choice of things to study in the fields of history. Choose wisely. And finally, it only remains for me to wish you good luck in your studies. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. Part 4. Complete the notes below. Use no more than three words for each answer. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. I'm glad you all found your way here. Now I'd like Dr. Wallace to introduce us to the Arboretum. Good afternoon. Although at first glance the Arboretum may look like a park, it is a research and teaching facility that also provides a place for people to develop a positive relationship with nature. When then University of Wisconsin-Madison purchased the land, mostly during the 1930s. 
much of it bore little resemblance to its pre-settlement state. Instead, it had been turned into cultivated fields and pastures that had fallen into disuse. The university's arboretum committee decided, early on, to try to bring back the plants and animals that had lived on the land before its development. Though they may not have anticipated it at the time, the committee's foresight resulted in the arboretum's ongoing status as a pioneer in the restoration and management of ecological communities. In focusing on the re-establishment of historic landscape, particularly those that predated large-scale human settlement, they introduced a whole new concept in ecology, ecological restoration. The process of returning an ecosystem or piece of landscape to a previous, usually more natural, condition. Madison was a fast-growing city in the 1920s. Fortunately, some leading citizens recognised the need to preserve open space for Madison's residents. Most of the Arboretum's current holdings came from purchases these civic leaders made during the Great Depression. In addition to inexpensive land, the Depression brought a ready supply of hands to work it. Between 1935 and 1941, crews from the Civilian Conservation Corps were stationed at the Arboretum and provided most of the labour needed to begin establishing ecological communities within the Arboretum. Efforts to restore or create historic ecological communities have continued over the years, with the result that the Arboretum's collection of restored ecosystems is not only the oldest, but also the most extensive such collection. In addition to these native plant and animal communities, the Arboretum, like most Arboreta, has traditional collections of labelled plants arranged in garden like displays. These horticultural collections featuring trees and shrubs of the world, are the state's largest woody plant collections. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.